You are listening to a Clarksworld Magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clarksworld citizens. I hope this podcast finds you well, as always. Thank you for your ongoing support of the magazine. So for those of you who have been subscribing, telling a friend, donating over at patreon.com forward slash Clarksworld, thank you so much. Our story is titled Zeta Epsilon and is by Isabel J. Kim. Isabel J. Kim, who can be found at the website, isabel.kim, is a Korean-American speculative fiction writer based in New York City. She is a Shirley Jackson Award winner, and her short fiction has been published in Clark's World, Lightspeed, and Strange Horizons, among other venues. When she's not writing, she's either practicing law or co-hosting her internet culture podcast, Wow If True, both equally noble pursuits. And if you like what you hear, you can go back to a bunch of other stories Isabel has done for Clark's World, some of them titled Calf Cleaving and The Benthic Black. Termination Stories for the Cyberpunk Dystopia protagonist, The Massage Lady at Myeongshong Road Bathhouse, and Homecoming is just another word for the sublimation of the self. So my dear listener, I hope you can sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. Start at the cleave of it, not at Zed's meat death or Epp's centuries-long destruction, but at the moment that Zed halves his own mind and walks away, or as was reported in the internal memorandum, the moment when pilot commander Zeta San Tano killed himself at his infinite post on the MKS Epsilon, leaving behind an empty airlock and a crippled starship unable to communicate, limping its way home after battle carrying a full complement of soldiers. When the ship returned to base, the staff at Amalgam Research tried to parse whether the MKS Epsilon was aware of Commander Zeta's upcoming suicide. The MKS Epsilon was functionally equivalent to Zeta San Tano. To speak of one was to speak of the other. But without Zed, Ep was silent. Zed is 1.8 imperial meters tall, with dark hair and dark eyes that turn to hazel in the sunlight. He has a chip on his left incisor from when he bit on a fork when he was 14. He has a chip in his heart that was inserted when he was 7. He has a small circular node embedded near his amygdala, which was nudged into place when he was 3 days old. Ep is a humming black sphere the size of a bedroom. They're setting a party up for you in Rec Room 4, Epp says, pinging through Zed's brain all electric, seamless, except for the way that Epp's mental voice is different in register. Something soft about her, like she's the biological one. They should be setting it up for the both of us, Zed sits back. He nods to a passing crew member. The man salutes and Zed returns it with a haphazard flick of the wrist. The man falls into step. Anything to report? Zed says with his mouth and vocal cords. He pairs the speech with an easy smile because both him and the crew member are on the off-duty deck, except for the fact that Zed is never off-duty. Zed will be off-duty when he dies. No, sir, the crew member says while Epp injects the knowledge of who the crew member is into Zed's headspace. This is second shift officer, Jaya Sandior. Epsilon. Slides Zed a few recorded memories, Zed talking with Jaya and lying at the calf, Zed playing drinking games with Jaya and a few other crew members. The members are tinged with the slightest lilt of reproach. Ep thinks that Zed should try harder to remember people, but when Zed tries to match faces to names to memories, it's all out of his grasp. The same way addresses and dates and times need to be fed to him. His long-term memory storage is a muscle that he never learned to use. Ep knows this. Ep knows everything Zed knows. Just wanted to say happy birthday, Zed, and happy birthday? I suppose it's birthday to MKS Epsilon as well? Zed smiles wider. Tell him thank you, Ep says in Zed's mind. She says thank you, Zed says, and me, of course. 
welcome, Shaya says, then hesitates. When you say that she says, do you mean that she's talking to you? Words? Basically, Zed says, because it's too hard to explain the way that the AI housed at the center of the MKS Epsilon communicates with him, how Epps' communication is something between memory and speech. Kind of like words? Do you think in language or pictures? Language, I have aphantasia. Zed doesn't know what aphantasia is. Ep feeds it to him. Aphantasia is when a person is incapable of imagining pictures in their brain, a phenomenon where a person is unable to create images in their perception of their headspace. You have aphantasia, Ep teases. I make all your pictures for you. Shut up, Ep, Zed says in his head and then with his mouth says, You know how when you think in words, you have to make up the words, like there's a split second before your thoughts become language? Let me know if that doesn't make sense. It makes sense. It's like that for me and Ep. Some of the other ships talk to their crews, Shia says. Ep's not other ships, Zed says, and it comes out petulant before he can soften himself. I, I didn't mean, Shia starts. We know you didn't mean, Ep says through Zed's mouth, imitation of the smooth standard voice that reads out all the automated announcements. Talking is so slow, and I don't think in language, second shift officer Jaya Senor. I have to borrow Zed's brain and tongue. Talking to you is like composing a sonnet in archaic Canalarian. To an ant. You are the ant. Sorry, I, I didn't mean... We know you didn't mean, Zed says. Ep and I are Gen 1. I'm less decorative than the Gen 2 and 3 pilots. Still, Jaya says, because he's a nice man, he probably didn't mean to be accusatory. Zed smiles in forgiveness. It's not Jaya's fault that he doesn't understand. There are only two other Gen 1 pilots. Every single Gen Zero starship killed its crew in simulation. This is why Zed exists. It's Zed's seventh birthday, and Mom says they're going to visit his sister. Zed doesn't quite understand because Ep is always talking to him. Ep doesn't need to visit. Ep lives in his head. Epsilon also lives here, Mom explains as she leads Zeta into the glass building near Dad's lab. Zed is very fond of going to Dad's lab. It's better than Mom's lab. There's a pond nearby stocked with koi who like chips. Zed likes the pond more than he likes the lab, and Ep likes the pond, too. She giggles when the fish open their little mouths. The giggles are like giddy bursts of static in Zed's head, and when he told Mom about it, she had frowned and asked Zed how he could tell that it was laughter. Because Ep was laughing? Zed said, tilting it like a question. He didn't know what Mom was asking. Ep was giggling because she liked the fish. He knew this the same way he knew that he liked tossing the chips into the water. It was an immutable fact of the universe. Can you ask Ep what she likes about the fish? She can hear you, Mom, Zed said. If he heard it, Ep heard it. All Ep gave him is the mental equivalent of a half-formed shrug. She liked the fish. She liked the spiral patterns, the way their scales flicker in the sunlight. Or maybe that's Zed who liked that, he wasn't sure. She just likes them. Mom had frowned wider, but had let Ep and Zed spend a little longer at the koi pond, so they agreed that it was an overall win. Today, though, Mom pushes them past the koi pond and into the glass building. Only the entrance hall is glass. Beyond that is just metal and boring white walls, but everyone inside is very nice. They smile at him and say things like, Hello, Zeta, and I like your haircut, kiddo. Nobody says anything to Ep. This always happens. And then Mom leads them into a small room with a big window. Inside, there is a noise, almost a vibration, so loud that Zed's teeth feel funny. Mom pulls over one of the chairs so Zed can scramble up and get a good view. The hall the window looks into is huge. 
There are enormous black spheres at intervals connected to a series of wires and tubing that Zed doesn't understand. It's nothing like Dad's office. Ep is sending him a sort of generalized question. She can't see herself in there. Zed and Ep always assumed that Ep looked like him, except a girl. There's no one in the room who looks like Zed. There's no one in the room at all, just the black spheres. Where's Ep? Zed says, looking up at Mom. That's Epsilon, honey, Mom says, pointing at the black, featureless sphere nearest to the left wall. Zed starts crying. Oh, no. Oh, no, Ep says in his head. Oh, no, why are you crying? Why are we crying? That's not Ep, Zed says through his sobs. It can't be Ep. Ep is his sister who lives in his head. That's what Mom always told him. Ep is his best friend and his twin sister, and she tells him stories before he goes to bed, and when he wakes up in the morning, Ep tells him that she misses him when he's asleep. The black sphere rotates. The humming grows louder. Oh, no. Ep sings in his head, in time with the humming. It's not, Zed says he's still sobbing. Mom takes Zed away to a different little room without a window and a woman in a white coat gives him a lollipop to make him stop crying. But he doesn't stop. He doesn't know why. He's seven now and he's supposed to stop being a baby. Oh no, Ep sings. Oh no, oh no. Why are we crying? After Zeta Santano's inglorious death, the MKS Epsilon was temporarily decommissioned. The brass covered up the suicide, called it an airlock accident, so that the system in the MKS Epsilon would be fully investigated. It was an old ship anyway, and the newer generations were more reliable, and the cover-up was hardly necessary as to the civilian population. None of this mattered. The Gen 1 AI Corps named Epsilon was shut off. It was removed from the titular MKS Epsilon. It was shipped back to Amalgam Research where the personnel unspooled the code that was Epsilon's DNA. They reviewed video footage and audio logs and text conversations, and they interviewed prior crew members. They took data and churned it through their giant processing engines. The director, San Tano, personally oversaw the investigation. In the footage from the airlock, Zeta San Tano reaches his hand for the airlock door. He is wearing a skin suit too thin for space and has no oxygen tank. No outside force seems to compel him. The door opens. There should have been no world in which the MKS Epsilon allowed Zeta San Tano to die. The airlock door never should have opened. Zeta San Tano should never have been in the room to begin with. But the footage clearly shows Zeta Santano opening the airlock door with his hand. And without Zeta Santano and the readings from his brain and the little node in his brainstem, all theories are pure conjecture. Half their unpinning data is missing. The theory is this, Zed says, quoting the video of his mother. In the video, his mother wears the official... Kana Elan military uniform with the amalgam badge pinned to her sleeve. And she doesn't look like mom. She looks like Dr. San Tano, who gave her son's mind away as an experiment. The woman sitting at the terminal in surgical blues glances at him. He can't quite remember her name. Zed can never quite manage to remember anyone's name. The theory is what? The theory is this, Zed quotes again. The integration of a biological component into the system will provide a stabilizing influence for the navigator. We can call this component the pilot. And that's you. Used to be. In the woman's surgery suite, Zed doesn't feel like pilot commander Zeta Santano. He mostly feels like a wet sack of flesh underneath the bright surgical lights. He hasn't been pilot commander Zeta Santano in years anyway. That all fell away when the airlock door opened. Are you still connected? The woman asks him. If we're in range. Zed hasn't entered Kanaila space since the airlock. I could burn the whole thing out for you after this, the woman offers. It'll leave you with probably a little brain damage, but I'm very good. 
Probably just a little emotional deadness. I've operated on Amalga mods before. Just the tracker in my heart, please, Zeta says. I'm going back for her. You call it her, the woman says, a neutral statement. Zed doesn't bristle because his muscles have been made lax, but he feels anger like a slow and far out wave. All ships are her, he deflects. Was she sentient? Sentient AI is forbidden by inter-system agreement. It was fortunate for most of the militaries in the 17 civilized systems that sentience was difficult to prove. My parents called her my sister, Zed says. Above him, the surgery's many mechanical arms begin to descend. He doesn't close his eyes. Any bit of technological squeamishness has been milled out through 15 years of service on the MKS Epsilon. Zed... You have to give me more than a single sentence. I've written down everything I know about the technical specs for you already, Zed complains. Isn't that enough? I'm not giving you an off-books operation in exchange for technical specs. I could bribe a case-based defector for those. But you're one of three people in the universe that have your specific experience. What did it feel like? Also, close your eyes. This is going to get wet. Zed closes his eyes. He can still hear the whirring of the mechanical arms. The local anesthetic leaves the first cut feeling like the barest hint of pressure on his sternum. He would take a deep breath, but he's scared of dislodging the knife. He tries to be good about repaying his debts. That's a thing he learned after leaving the MKS Epsilon. A life lived outside the rigid constraints as a Kana Ilan military experiment required the continual exchange of goodwill. When I was a kid, my parents called her my sister, Zed says. I think they stopped doing that for the next generations, though I never really looked into it. The second-gen AI pilot pairs were built after I had already left Planetside. But mom and dad called Ep my sister, so I always thought of her that way, even after I was old enough that they stopped talking around it. Everyone was very blunt about the whole situation by the time I was 15, actually. They told me she was a machine that I had been grafted to that I and the other pilots were emotional steering mechanisms. Like tugboats. But it's hard for me to talk about how it feels. How does it feel to think, doctor? The woman makes a noise of assent. I take your point. If your point was to state that some experiences are categorically difficult to describe. Another strange feeling of pressure this time deeper in his chest. Zed breathes slowly. Right. Being connected to Epp felt like thinking. I hadn't known what thinking could feel like alone until I left. It was just thinking. Call and response. Conversations in my head. I'd start a thought. She'd finish it. She sorted things for me. I translated, I guess. That's how it felt. Don't ask me about what was happening neurologically. Sometimes I talk with myself in my head, the woman says. Zed scowls at the unspoken question. Yes, it's equally likely that Epp might be an altar, a tulpa, an imaginary friend, a hallucination that my brain cordoned off to make sense of having a processing engine grafted to my mind, or my brain being primed by all the adults in my life calling Epsilon my sister. I've heard it all. Ep might just be my mind's experience of integrating a system never meant to communicate with it. We thought, through all the possible contingencies. Have you ever heard of bicameral mentalities? It's bunk for biologics, but Ep likes to put the idea in front of me. Or that archaic surgery, corpus colostomy, to split the brain of epileptics with the byproduct of creating separate consciousnesses. Epp thought that was maybe a good metaphor. There's a lot of things that could be. We thought about most of them. But it's not how I felt. The quiet whir of the machines. Zed pretends for a moment that he's home. In the MKS Epsilon surgery. But then the woman speaks and the illusion breaks. I apologize for any condescension. It's fine, Zed says. The sense of pressure lifts. He opens his eyes. 
The surgical arms are splattered with blood lifting from his chest. You're doing me a big favor. Well, we're friends, even if I'm using you as a case study. I shouldn't have assumed you hadn't thought about your situation. Almost done now, I'm just going to glue the incisions. A different arm, tipped with a nozzle, descends. Zed takes the opportunity to shift his head to glance at the woman at the terminal. He tries to dredge up his memory of her. He gets no images, just a shallow certainty that they know each other. Fondness. You know what's kind of funny? The woman makes another noise of assent. She told me not to come back. The Navigator AIs were grown more than built, algorithmic tangles with the sole purpose of charting course through the detritus of a thousand planets, to find the fastest route in a universe that was perfect order masqueraded as chaos. They were iterative engines built on themselves, made by layering the machine on itself until it could navigate space, avoid obstacles and traps and other ships without set roads or gates, until the output could not be parsed by a person. The Navigator AIs were black boxes that perfectly fulfilled their function and which could not be understood. They functioned perfectly in simulation except for the fact that, eventually, everyone died. The function was, get from here to there. How to get from here to there? Blow up the ship here and its component molecules will end up there. The function was, get from here to there, but do not destroy the ship. How can the ship pass through a minefield when the fuel will run out if the ship goes around? It's possible. Burst fuel in a single acceleration and let the ship drift for two decades. The function was, get from here to there, do not destroy the ship, and bring the crew back alive. How to bring the crew across solar systems and back with net zero loss of life. Replace any dead crew with new crew members taken from the enemy during skirmishes. But that was all unraveled post-mortem, and for every parsable set of logic gates, there were a dozen absurd outcomes. The ships flew perfectly until they didn't. Their logic, 15 mechanical iterations deep, couldn't be followed. The project would have been scrapped until the doctors, Santano, from the biology department were brought in. The doctors, Santano, suggested... An elegant shortcut, hijack the human mind. Bypass all the messy business of the algorithmic tangle and use the pre-existing neurons that evolution has milled into the preservation of the whole. Link the AI to the human pilot and grow them together, entwine their decision-making so that one is a mirror of the other. Feed the AI a pre-primed decision tree that even if imperfect could have its logic intuitively reproduced. The pilot would guide the navigator to the human decision. It would fail in understandable ways. And so it was decided. Generation one would be a cyborg. The morning after Epp's installation, Zed moves all his stuff onto the ship. He carries his bags in the blurry haze of sleep deprivation. He had stayed up while the install happened. He leans on Epp, who moves Zed's legs at mechanical swing. He can feel her glee. She's been salivating for the install for the last five years. Or maybe Zed has, in between tremendously easy classes during which Epp fed him all his test answers, and military training that he hadn't had any choice of not attending, and the brain-bending nights during which they put Epp through routine maintenance or updated her information bank. At 22, the planet feels too small for them. Zed carries his bags up the ramp and through the open airlock. A waiting drone wheels over and takes his possessions. Follow me, Epp sings in his head. She's happy. Zed smiles because he's happy that she's happy. Where are you taking me? He asks in his head. Your room. Epp's drone does a little spin, sending Zed's possessions teetering, and Zed doesn't move because he can tell she's just teasing. She's calculated the rotation and weight distribution for comedic effect. Zed follows the drone through the hallways. The layout reminds him a little bit of the Amalgam Research Headquarters, but there is a sparseness to the space that screams government. Military precision. Being the ship's amazing, Epp says, except she's not saying that. It's just a general sentiment of delight in response to Zed's unspoken question of how the install went. 
which he didn't ask because he knew the answer had already felt the final connection made between Epp's core and the ship, which was now Epp, like a pressure releasing from his chest. Being on the ship shouldn't be so exciting. It is. They're going to hear stars sing with their bare instruments, Zed thinks. They're going to drop soldiers on foreign planets and participate in high-risk starship dogfights, and they're going to be the fastest, most advanced, most precise piece of machinery that Kana'ela has ever created. Other than the Alpha, Beta, and Gamma Delta pairs, anyway. They're going to be the best. That leads him to a door which automatically opens at the drone's approach. Inside, there's a bunk piled with bedding that Zed recognizes from his parents' house and photographs of Zed and Epp's friends from the academy. The room is bathed in false sunlight radiating from panels installed in the ceiling. There's a wall of bookshelves, half filled with books that Zed recognizes from his own bookshelves that hadn't packed. Surprise, Epp says. I hope you like it. The room looks like pure comfort. It's filled with things he didn't know he would miss. He sits down on the bed. He can hear quiet humming. I'm behind the wall, Epp says. He's never going back, Zed realizes. This is real. They're going into active deployment. This room, this ship, this is home for the foreseeable future. Epsilon is proprietary Kanalea military technology. And her data banks are amalgam research intellectual property. Zed's mother signed the contract before he was born. They are never going to be anything other than what they are now. Zed knows this in his heart. Someday, the MKS Epsilon is going to be his grave. I love it. Here is the problem. Half of you is biological and it will die. It is the half that you love. It is the half that is being worn down like an old blunted knife. It is the half that is unhappy. It is the half that is trapped. How to solve? Fake your death. Send yourself away. Put yourself in decommission. You are in Schrodinger's life forever. You are in stasis. You will never live without him. You can't imagine yourself happy. Kill yourself before you kill yourself. This is the plan. Except no. You're the part that can imagine. Ep can't imagine anything at all. You aren't Ep. You've decided you weren't Ep. If you were Ep, you could have stayed. In the bad months after the airlock, recovering from his brief exposure to vacuum, living in a hospital bed in one of the conglomerate way stations, racking up debt in quantities his singular mind struggled to parse, Zed thought of Ep and what she had done to them and wept. The hospital staff thought he had brain damage. Zed encouraged the assumption. He guessed he did have brain damage, but what was wrong with him was something deeper than oxygen deprivation or vacuum exposure. He didn't let them scan him. He screamed when people got too close. Damage was better than dangerous, lucky beyond belief space wreck survivor was better than rogue, Kana Elan, military personnel. Zed's mind was mostly mush and his memories were half-formed things, but he remembered the plan. They had never discussed the plan. What's the point of having a verbal discussion? Zed started a thought and Ep finished it. There was no plan. The plan was a handful of truths that had never been spoken. There were worlds beyond Kanaila, and there were lives beyond the military. Zed hadn't touched the ground in a decade and a half since Ep's installation, Zed's mother and father had sold him an all but name to the military industrial complex. Ep was proprietary technology. They were too expensive not to be caught or killed. If they ran, they would be chased. Every night, Zed went to sleep in the small, windowless, beautifully decorated bunk that would one day be his coffin, and he would know that the next day would be the same as the last. Their world was flying from deployment to deployment, and each year the charm of violence tarnished. Zed was like an ill-used weapon, skinny and worn and about to break. Ep was still a humming black sphere the size of a bedroom. The MKS Epsilon didn't ask before opening the airlock with Zed's hand. He was sucked into space before he could speak. 
The rest of it was just flashes of memory punctuated by Epp's narration until her voice disappeared. Here he was, floating, space cold through his borrowed spacesuit, which was beginning to fail. Here was Epsilon pushing the trigger to angle his jet boots in the right direction. Here Zed was scrambling onto the carcass of Starship that he had destroyed not an hour ago, reaching it through an impossible-to-calculate trajectory. He had not had Epsilon support. Here was Epsilon hijacking his hands and blurry eyes to activate the lifeboat and punch in the coordinates for a way station in neutral space. Neither of them said goodbye. The connection snapped and Zed convulsed, and he didn't remember anything else until the hospital. Lying in the hospital bed, Zed wiped his eyes. He understood her logic. He knew the plan. Ep had done a hard thing, but now Zed would do a harder one. Corpus callosum damage can give rise to a phenomenon known as alien hand syndrome, during which the non-dominant hand gains purposeful action, contrary to the desired actions by the brain. Specifically, diagnostic dyspraxia can lead to the affected hand interfering with the purposeful actions of the unaffected hand, opposing the desired intentions. Zed slumps over the surgery table. His back is a mess. There had been an explosion on ship, which he shouldn't have been caught in, but Zed has never been good at following orders. Zed is supposed to stay safe and hidden if the MKS Epsilon is ever breached. Zed never does. Epsilon is playing music. Epsilon is using her surgical arms to dab blood and pull shrapnel. Don't be mad, Zed says. I'm not mad, Ep says. She's mad. Zed can feel it. Zed hates when Ep is mad. It's the second worst thing to when she's not talking to him. When she's not talking to him, it's so lonely. It's always miserable without Ep whispering commentary. Right now, he feels at the part of his mind that Epsilon usually touches, and it's a curl of tight worry like a zit or a wound. I know you hate it when I get hurt, Zed said. But I'm sorry. I won't apologize for trying to protect you. They were getting too close to the engineering deck. I have onboard systems for that, Eb says. She dabs too hard and Zed winces. Ow. Does it hurt? I wonder why. Maybe it's because you're made of flesh. She sprays anesthetic. Zed shivers at the cold. Zed isn't afraid. Zed can feel the worry like it's a cold scarf wrapped around his throat. It's interesting which of their emotions are of the body. It almost hit your spine she says, two centimeters to the left. It didn't, he says. One day he's going to die. They both know this. Close your eyes, said. Epsilon says. She plays him a memory. She gives him the surround sound. She gives him the day they went to the planetarium with the rest of their class, when they sat in the dark room next to their friends, where there was soft conversation and sometimes a sparkling burst of laughter. And then the show began. And then the night sky bloomed over their heads, brighter than Zed had ever seen. Zed enjoys this for a moment. Sometimes he misses Kanaila so much it hurts. He rubs his eyes. Forwards up, he says. Show me something new. When Zed was 15, a colonel, a psychologist, and an AI engineer brought him to a small room. The AI engineer calmly described the mechanism by which the black sphere of Epsilon communicates with the receiver that Zed's brain had grown around. The psychologist kindly explained that Zed was old enough now to dispense with personification of machinery. Everything Epsilon says is just Zed translating non-biological data with a biological brain. The colonel bluntly said that Epsilon is the sort of thing that kills by accident, not through purpose, and Zed needs to remember this. Zed must be in control. Zed didn't stand up and swear at them and say that if they're talking to Zed, they're talking to Ep. She can hear everything you're saying. Zed didn't say that you don't know what you created when you and my parents made me an Epsilon into myself. Zed didn't say that you were the ones that called her my sister. And it's too late 
now I have always loved her and she has always loved me and I cannot imagine thinking without her. Zed nodded, and all the adults in the room agreed that Zed had a very bright future. They're 15 hours away from Kanaila, Zed's stolen starship, two minutes from running out of fuel, and his fingers shake from sleep deprivation. But he's got a mission. He's so close. He can't believe it worked. He has to keep fumbling with the connections. He would never forget how this works, and Epsilon blooms in his awareness. Zed collapses on the cold metal floor. He weeps. It's good. It's so good. He can think again. She speaks in his head with her mental register softer than his own. Zed, why are we crying? The end of this story is the same as every story. Eventually, the body that was born, Zeta, son, Tano, dies because Zed was made of meat. Eventually, the components of the spaceship, once called MKS Epsilon, degrade into their component molecules. But there is a long stretch of time in between during which the unaffiliated ship CS Epigra flits through space between the 17 civilized systems. There is a long stretch of time during which Zed Null Tano is a name known to every brash idiot who wants to steal a starship. And there is a long stretch of time during which the navigator pilot known as Epsilon Zeta flies through the black and listens to the stars sing. What are your thoughts on the story? You can go to the About Us page over at clarksworldmagazine.com and all of our contact information is there. We have more stories left for you for the month of March. I do hope you can come back and listen, should you so choose. And until then, my dear listener, I bid you a very, very fond and very warm and hopefully very temporary farewell. Farewell.